These days I get a lot of feedback as well as comments, but one really caught my attention. Kunal writes on YouTube, would it be possible for you to create a tutorial on how to work with NetCDF files using any variable such as surface temperature from satellite data in NetCDF formats? He then continues that he noticed that many people uh, in the atmospheric science community who work with satellite data usually opt for Python. And it seems that tutorials on uh, handling these files with R are lacking. So many people then just prefer using Python for plotting special maps. Now, I think we should not allow this definitely. And I'm going to take up this challenge and show you how you can work with these files and map them easily. Hello, people, and welcome to my channel. My name is Milos, and I'm a creator of original maps, which I regularly share with people on Instagram and Twitter. In today's tutorial, we're taking up on a challenge to work with NetCDF files in R and to plot them with ggplot2. So, in specific, we will be making today a surface temperature map. And for that purpose, we will do several important steps. The first one is we will visit the climate change services and especially its climate data store from which we will take the data. But the data itself, we will communicate through API with the help of a Krieg R package in R. Then I will show you how you can easily work with these files and plot them, creating static and animated maps. We will wrap up our journey with a time-lapse map and using ggAnimate package. Without any further ado, let's roll! All right, ladies and gents, welcome back to our where we are about to start our new tutorial, Visualize Weather Data with R. And uh, let's actually start coding. The first thing we're going to do here is set our working directory. So the way we do that is we use the function from base R, set WD, and then we define the pathway to our directory. So this is my working directory, but you should here define uh, your own directory. Uh, next thing that I want to do here is I want to put this working directory, I want to put it uh, into an object which is going to be defined main deer. And the way I actually grab the working directory is with the function also from base R, get wd. Why did I do this? Because I want to create a new directory, which you do by typing deer.create, and I want to call this new directory uh, weather. All right. Now, this new directory will be created after this download. So uh, it's going to be uh, the child directory of downloads, right? Now, uh, the next thing I want to do also is I want to create a pathway to this new directory. So I'm going to call it weather underscore deer path. And then I'm just going to simply append this main deer. I'm just going to append it uh, using paste from base R. And I need to add slash at the end of uh, this downloads pathway so that it's recognized actually properly. And then I'm just going to say here, weather. All right. And then the last thing is I want to set the working directory. The uh, working directory will be set to this new one, weather deer path. All right. This is a bit of a boring part, but I just wanted to show you how you can create new folders uh, within R. You don't need to go into your operating system and then do some point and click. You can simply do it here and then you can also set the working directory here. Now we can uh, kick off with uh, loading packages. In today's tutorial, we'll be creating a few temperature maps which are based on the data from the Copernicus Climate Change Services and its uh, climate data store, which uh, has an API through which we can communicate and get the data we need. Now, we are very lucky to have a specific package in R, Krieg R, developed by Eric Kush, that can actually uh, communicate with the API for us download the data that we need, pre-process and do some uh, statistical resampling, and then return for any part of the world that we need. 
So this is a pretty cool uh, library. Unfortunately, it's still not on CRAN, so we cannot use install.packages and then just simply do that. We have to install a developmental version of this package. But don't worry, it's pretty straightforward. So the way we do that is the following. First of all, if you don't have dev tools installed, you should definitely do that. So install packages and then dev tools. All right. That's the first thing, because why do we install dev tools? Because we need install GitHub from dev tools, uh, which will help us install the developmental version of this package. So install GitHub and then the pathway to this is actually the website. So it's a GitHub. So HTTPS uh, github.com. And then we need to access Eric Kush's uh, directory, uh, which is free. So now that you hopefully downloaded Creek R without any problems, we can move on to the second stage, which is actually uh, declaring the libraries that we need in this session. So libraries we need. And then installing libraries that we currently don't have and then loading all of those that we need. So in order to do that, we need to define a list. Let's call it libs. These are going to be the libraries that we will use in this session. So as we said, Creek R is one of the libraries that we cannot install through CRAN. So installing this way is not going to help, but we will definitely load it at the end. What is important though, is that you run this uh, previous command if you didn't and uh, install it from the GitHub repo itself. Nevertheless, we defined this one. So Creek R we will use uh, again to communicate with the API uh, from that uh, climate data store and get the data we need. That's the first thing. The second one is the umbrella package, Tidyverse. And I don't need to mention this for most of you who are familiar with R. This one is used for data wrangling and data visualization and includes um, such packages as, for example, ggplot2, which we will definitely use in, in this session. Uh, there is a next one, which is called Tidier. This one we will also use for data wrangling, but unfortunately it's not implemented in the Tidyverse uh, umbrella package. So we need to load it separately. Uh, the next one is the SF package. So because I want to show you here how you can uh, get the temperature map for any country in the world, we will need to crop the raster file uh, at some point. So the asset package will help us load those uh, country shape files and then use them. Now, in order to get the country shape file, I like to use JSCO R. It's a very convenient uh, package which communicates with uh, the JSCO services and helps you uh, fetch uh, the country shape file for any country in the world in different resolutions. Class int is the package that will help us with creating uh, nice legend bins for uh, our legends in the map. Uh, then in this tutorial, since we're going to map temperature, I would like to use the so-called Spectre Color Palette. And this one comes from our Color Brewer package. It's a very nice package uh, which contains uh, several uh, palettes that you can use maybe in your project as well. And then finally, apart from creating static maps with ggplot2, I would also like to create a nice animation uh, maps that would cover, you know, uh, some uh, amounts of time. And for that, we will use gganimate. All right, now that we define the libraries that we need, the second thing is to install those that are missing. So let's make a comment. Install missing libraries or packages, if you will. So that's the second thing. Uh, now, the way we do that, we say we first need to define libraries that are installed. And how do we know they're installed? Well, from those that we need, which are defined as libs, 
uh, I want to see if they are among the installed packages on my machine. So I'm going to check the row names of install packages. Easy as that. Right. Now, what if they're not installed? Well, then I need to create a for loop. So for those who are not installed, I tell R to install them. So we do that in the following way. If any, if any installed libs are false. So basically if they're not installed, and then in R, in order to uh, create a for loop, you need to open this curly brackets and then inside of that, tell what to do. So if they're not among the install libraries, then install packages. So install packages. So install those packages uh, from the that libs list that are not among installed libraries. All right. So now we have that. This is going to make sure that those libraries that are not installed to be installed now. And then finally, let's simply load libraries. That's the final move. So we say like this, invisible. And then we apply to that list of libs. We apply the library arguments. That's the argument in R to load any package that you already have. And just also tip this one character dots only equals true. All right, that's it. And now we just need to run all of this and it will install the packages we need and it will load those that we don't have. And also remember to also install uh, the dev tools and also this one if you didn't. As I said, we are very lucky to have Creek R uh, as the package that is available in R, which will help us download the fifth generation weather forecast reanalysis from the climate data store of the Copernicus Climate Change Services. But now there is one more thing that we need to do before jumping into the code, which is in order to communicate with the API, even through Creek R, we need to have our unique user ID and uh, we need to have our unique uh, API key. And with these two, we can then uh, ask the API uh, through Creek R for the temperature data. Next thing, I am going to go now with you together to the website. I'm going to show you where the data sits, how it looks like, what are we going to get and how to register for free to get those things. All right, we kick off our adventure from the climate change service website, which is a host to a lot of interesting data sets on the weather data. And we will uh, search for them if we click on this data in the upper right corner, which opens up a new window and leads us directly to the climate data store where we will be able to search for data sets that we need. In our case, we want to search for the fifth generation uh, climate change services data. So this is uh, error five. And then we click on search and this opens uh, a lot of different data sets here. There's a bunch of them, um, but for our purpose that we need here is the one which is era five land. Now we will be working with the monthly data. So I will select this one. And this opens a new view with even more information about this data set. So this is a reanalysis data set, which provides a view of land variables over, over time. So it's a historical data at enhanced resolution. It stands at 0.1 degrees by 0.1 degrees. Uh, and it combines model data with observations from across the world to create a globally complete, uh, consistent picture of uh, different uh, variables. So it ranges from uh, 1950 to present. It's again on the monthly level. And in terms of variables, it's a wider rich data set. So it includes information on wind direction, temperature, evaporation, uh, ice levels, snowfall levels. It's, it's simply breathtaking, I would say. For us, the most important one is this variable, 
two amp temperature. So this is the temperature of air at two meters above the surface, whether it's a land or sea, ocean, or any inland waters. And it's calculated by interpolating between uh, the lowest model levels and the Earth's surface and takes into account the atmospheric conditions. And it's measured in Kelvin. So you see here units is uh, K, these are Kelvins. But it's not a problem, it says here, temperature measured in Kelvin can be converted to degrees Celsius by subtracting 273.15. And this is exactly what we're going to do. Now, we want to see, uh, we, we want to actually interact with the API, or at least see uh, how these variables are structured and uh, what is the actually the data and the labels that we can use. We need to click here on this tab, download data. So this will open a user interface where you can click on the things that you want to, uh, you know, uh, take from this API. And then you can ask for the actual codes that we can then uh, use in R. So uh, what we want here is the monthly average uh, reanalysis data sets. And we are interested here in 2M temperature. Uh, we are not interested in any other things like lakes, snow, so water. Not in this tutorial, at least. And then in terms of years, uh, let's say we just want to take 2023 and 2022, whatever it's available there. I mean, this is just for the demonstration purpose. I just want to show you uh, how actually uh, it's easy to build a query here. And let's say we want all the possible months. Uh, now, in terms of time, hours, because we are taking the month level, it's going to be simply just average over uh, over a certain period. So there's only one here for selection. And our cool stuff here is that you can even select, you know, a region that we need. Uh, and I will show you in R how easy it is to just crop what you need. For now, we can simply, you know, select this one. This is for the entire earth. And again, what we need here is uh, uh, this one, which is net CDF. Uh, yeah. So now if we want to see how it would look like, we just click on this show API request and it gives us actually um, uh, several things which are very important for us. Uh, one of them is, of course, the variable name. As you can see, it's 2M underscore temperature. This is something that we will plug in back in R uh, when, uh, when working with this. So this is very important. And also we are downloading this from era five land. Uh, and it's on the monthly level. So these are some of the things that are worth uh, remembering. So that would be in short how you you build this. But because there is a very convenient package to, to download data from uh, this database, we don't really need to build this on our own. What we need to only know is what is the name of the data set uh, and actually what is the name of this you know, variable and in terms of time, we are able to, to uh, you know, find whatever we need. We'll be communicating with the Climate Change Service API using the Kriegar library in R. But to use uh, these services, we need to first obtain our unique user ID and our unique user API key. And to get those two, we need to register for free here by clicking on login slash register button in the upper right corner of the screen. You click here and then we need to click on the create new account tab. This will open us a registration form where you simply need to fill out some basic things such as your email, first and last name, and alternatively country and sector where you come from. And uh, very importantly, you should uh, also uh, check out these two terms of uh, services, so you should uh, accept them. Finally, you should also fill out the CAPTCHA here and then click on the create new accounts. In a short while, you will uh, have received email from climate.copernicus.eu where you will find a link. Uh, if you click on this link, it will prompt you back to the website where you will be uh, asked to uh, write down your password. The link will take you back to the website where you will be prompted to write a new password over certain strength. And after that, also to confirm uh, that password. And then you just simply click on save and login.
This will take you back to the Climate Data Store search engine, but now instead of searching for a data set, we go to the upper right corner once more, and if you successfully register, you will see your registered first and last name here. So you click on that, which opens your user panel. Over here, you will see the basic information that you registered, terms and conditions that you accepted, and finally, and most importantly, your user ID and the API key that you can use to communicate with the uh, API of the Climate Copernicus services. So we will then copy these two things, your user ID and the API, and then we will use them in R to easily fetch uh, this temperature data set. Hopefully by now you have your unique uh, user ID and the unique API key. And now we can start working with Krigar and fetch that uh, temperature data. But before we actually write the code, let's first get uh, familiar with uh, this package and specifically with its download era 5 function. So era 5 land is exactly what we need. And this function will allow us to communicate with the API. Now, what does it have here? It has several things. First one is variable. So this is simply what is the, the feature that you want? Is it the wind direction? Is it the temperature? Is it the uh, snow levels or maybe ice or evaporation levels, whatever? So in our case, it's going to be that uh, one that we saw before on the website. So 2M underscore temperature, which means two meter temperature. All right. So that's one thing. Then what you can further specify here is even type. So we don't need to specify these things uh, simply because we are just going to get uh, the reanalysis one. So it's by default. And this one is also only available for era five data. We are fetching the era uh, five land, which you can specify in the data set argument. So this is specifically if you want to uh, have something from the uh, era five, we are just going to go for era five land. The next important thing is where does your data start and where does it end? Very importantly here, it needs to be in a date format. So it needs to be defined this way. So it needs to be defined as a first year, full year, and then dash month, and then dash days. And it should be string. So it should have quotation marks. The same goes for date stop, which is until when the data goes, right? Now, this is just the start. So this is just like a time frame that you need. The next thing uh, is what is the level of the time aggregation that you are looking for? You can uh, look for hour, day, month, or year. And this is within this T resolution part. So it's a, in other words, temporal resolution. In this tutorial, we will be working with the month. Uh, but it's also possible to download hour and day and year. But keep in mind that for hour and day, the number of files is going to increase. Basically, if you choose, for example, hour, then for every hour, you're going to have one raster file and that one needs to be downloaded and then put together. So it's going to be very, very intensive to do that. All right. Then there are some other very interesting things that you can also customize here. Uh, this one is in case you define the temporal uh, resolution, this is what you want to do uh, with that one. So do you want to do month by month or within a certain month, you want to also kind of specify the range? Uh, it's worth playing with this one, but in our case, we're just going to uh, uh, download the data for every month. So average data for every month. Speaking of average, there is also this fun argument uh, where you can apply what actually you, you want to get in terms of a, a statistical aggregation itself. So by default, it's average, so it's mean, but you can also set minimum values or maximum. Let's say you're looking for, let's say, temperature anomaly. So you're going to look at those maximum temperatures, right? So maybe in this case, you would want to opt for the, the max function. Um, the default option, of course, is to get uh, the temperature data for the entire globe. But using this extend argument, you can specify two things. The first one is the bounding box. So you will specify the minimum, maximum, longitude and latitude values of uh, the region of your interest. 
But the next very cool thing is you can also provide to this extent argument, you can provide a shape file of your country, and then it's going to return the raster file only for that shape file. So I find it pretty, pretty useful. And especially for today's tutorial, where we're going to be also working with countries, but I'm going to show you both methods. What happens when you uh, take only uh, the extent of a bounding box and what happens when you provide uh, country polygons. Then there are some additional uh, things here, but two crucially important, without which this is not going to run. First one is API user. So this one is that user ID that you just got upon registering on the Climate Data Store website. And the second one is the API key, which you also need to declare here. All right. Then there are some additional things like, for example, number of cores that, uh, you know, the, the library is going to use during this uh, um, uh, processing of data, the timeout as well, and whether it's going to leave that message is going to be verbose, right? Is there going to be a report on what, is, what it does or not? So by default, it is, uh, it is uh, turned on, but you can also choose something else. So this would be the things. If you scroll down, you will also see maybe some examples, but for our purposes, that's everything that we need. Next thing, let's write this and wrap it into a code. All right, folks, let's get down to business and build that query using Krigar's function download era. In this tutorial, we'll be creating temperature map of Poland. So let's start off by first defining our object, which is going to be called Poland temp. And then from Krigar, we call download era and then within this one the first thing we want to define is that variable so as we said it's 2m temperature that's the first thing the second thing is the name of the data set now by default we have era 5 land so we don't really need to write this one but I just do it here so that, you know, if you are using maybe era five that you should specify because era five land is a default one. All right. The next thing is the temporal scope. So how long we want this to, to, to be, uh, let's say we want to go from 1st of January, 2022 until 1st of January, 2023. So like 13 months. Uh, so the way to do that is date start so this is for the starting date and date stop is for the date which is going to be the last date so we will be using dates a bit later as well so maybe it's just better to define a variable here which would be start date and uh here we need to define it as a string and as i said it needs to be start with a year and then it needs to go with the month so uh, pay attention here. So even though it's a single digit month, you still need to include zero. Also goes for the date. So this is going to be the, the start date. Now the end date, we said same format. All right. So let's define here start date and end date as well. All right, the next thing is what is the aggregation level, temporal aggregation level? So this is called T resolution, not so much intuitive if you ask me. As I said, you can uh, choose hourly, daily, monthly, or uh, yearly levels. We're gonna go for month. So the way this is gonna work is, uh, once we build a query, we run it. This will download 13 files. So for every month, average data, and then um, this function will pull them together into one, so stacked uh, raster uh, file. So that's pretty awesome. Now, pay attention. If you're going for R, let's say, and you choose one day data, it will return 24 files and then put them together. So it's gonna take some time to download them. Just be aware of that. Now, there is also a question how this monthly data is going to be aggregated. Are we just looking at the overall average value for the entire month, so for every day of the month, or are we looking, for example, for something else? So this is defined by t-step, and the default one is one. All right. Then, 
what we want to also define is the directory where we're going to put this. And we already defined that one. So we said that it's going to be weather beer path. Then we need to define the file name also as a string. So this one should be Poland 2M temperature. That's about it. And then because we want to download Poland, it's not really possible to say here, hey, fetch me data for Poland. No, actually, you need to provide uh, a shape file and then Quick R will just uh, take those tiles that are needed and then cut them and just uh, bring you the Poland one. So this is called extent. Now, that means we need to fetch the shapefile of Poland. And we're going to use JSCore for that. So let's call this Poland SF. And let's use JSCO R's function. Uh, JSCO uh, gets countries. And then here we say country equals, you can also write Poland, but I like to use ISO2 code. So PL, that's the ISO2 for Poland. And resolution, how crisp is going to be the, the, the this map. So it goes uh, to from 1, 3, uh, 10, 20, 50. I'm just going to go for 10, let's say. All right. So now we have this from Poland SF, but unfortunately, this extent argument here does not accept uh, SF objects. It needs to be converted into a spatial object, so SP object. It's not a problem. So you do it like this, as, and then you open brackets, and then you define your SF object, and you say convert it to spatial. That's all. And then last but not least, actually, to the contrary, last but the most important thing is your API a user which is your user id so i'm just going to put here just some asterisk you should put so this is one is an integer so you should uh, use the one from your account that you got upon registration and the other one is api key also going to hide it here from you but you should also insert yours all right what do we have now here so let's let's just quickly recap on this we have the start and date we have the poland and then we have the query. This query will return to us temperature data for Poland between 1st of January 2022 and 2023 on the monthly level. And we're going to also save this as a single file to, uh, to our working directory here that we defined. I'll run the code now and we will then see what is actually going on in the backend. So, as you can see here, it says that the download has started. It's going to download 13 files, and this is number one. So it's going to be named number one. And based on my username and my API key. Um, and then after that is done, it's going to go to the next one. So it's going to download uh, the second one. And then all and all and until number 13 right so once this is done once it downloads all 13 files it's going to put them together into single files and it's just going to remove all those um, separate uh, files on the monthly level once the download is completed after a few minutes uh, you will receive uh, the final few lines so messages that the download is finished that the aggregation is done, that they put uh, together into a single file, that they also cut according to the polygon of Poland, and that they also chose the temporary aggregation of choice. Next thing is we will load this uh, single file and uh, then we will inspect what it is. We inspect the Poland temp object that we just created by running that query. And the first thing we notice, this is the class raster stack, which means that uh, several, in our case, 13 files we just put into one. We also notice the native resolution that we remember when we went to the data uh, store itself, which is uh, 0 0.10 and 0 0.10 degrees. 
Uh, also, this is the extent for Poland. Uh, the coordinates reference system or CRS is WGS84, so default one. And then we have this uh, number of strange names uh, ranging from X1 to X13. So these are the dates for which we downloaded it. It's quite unfortunate that it's like this, but this is because we use the polygon of Poland to actually get uh, the fitted uh, raster uh, file for our purposes. If we chose, however, the bounding box, it would have returned again this X1 to X13, but also the dates would be appended. We will need to uh, deal with this in due course because we do want to uh, create, uh, let's say, maps for specific uh, months, but we also want to create an animation map. And for that one, for the time lapse map, we do need to have dates in order to create those specific frames. And finally, there is something here which is called dimensions. So usually for raster files, you have three dimensions. Number of rows, the, uh, denoted here by n row. Number of columns, denoted by n col. Number of layers, so n layers. In our case, it's 13 layers because we have 13 months. But there's something else here which is called n cell. So it's 6,222. Now, this pertains to the specific file format that we just downloaded. This is called the NetCDF, or NC in this case, which is a network common data form. So this is a file format that is uh, used actually in academia and in specific research areas, so atmospheric, oceanic, uh, earth sciences, as well as in other fields where you have complex data sets. So what is actually NetCDF? This one is uh, uh, the actually collection of data sets. So it includes different data variables, different dimensions and attributes, and it's multidimensional. So it uh, can have arrays, tables, even time series. So in our case, this additional dimension that we have is actually uh, those 13 months. So uh, it's a very common uh, file format in all these different uh, areas and uh, different programming languages uh, have developed different libraries to be able to load this format and to deal with it and plot it. Luckily for us in R, it's pretty e easy to actually plot this file format. What we just need to uh, do, we need to uh, turn it into a data frame and then uh, also kind of uh, select those dates for which we want to work with. But oftentimes it's uh, very uh, difficult to work with these files. Uh, they are kind of a daunting exactly because of this multidimensionality. So we will here pay extra attention to this. So I want to show you how you can access properties of these files, how you can plot actually different levels, in our case months, and even how you can animate that. So in the next step, we will uh, go and finally plot this, I'm going to show you how you can uh, take different months from the specific file and plot them and then show you the uh, simple maps that you can create. All right, so plotting individual layers from this NC file. So for example, we want to take uh, temperature in June for Poland is quite straightforward. So we simply need to filter uh, that name. Uh, June is a six month, so the layer name will be X6 in our case. So we, uh, first of all, uh, go to Poland temp and we filter by using this double brackets and define X6. So this will give us uh, June temperatures for Poland. Then we create the pipeline. So we go to the next one. Now, uh, the way ggplot2 works is you need to convert uh, any raster object into a data frame in the following way. So instead of having those cell values, we will create centroids, so points, which would have X value, which is going to be its longitude, Y value, which is going to be its latitude, and Z value, which is going to be a certain, uh, you know, quantification of that point. In our case, it's temperature. In some other case, it can be, for example, elevation or evaporation, whatever. So the way you uh, now turn this uh, layer into data frame is by using base r function as data frame and to create those centroids we need to use x y equals t argument and we also want to remove any na's around it so we use na.rm we continue then our pipeline into the uh, creating a plot with ggplot2 so we call ggplot open brackets plus 
And to plot any raster file in ggplot2, you need to use geomtile argument. Within that one, we will create our main layer. And to do that, you need to specify aesthetics. So AES. Our aesthetics include X, they include Y, and they include also how are we going to represent those temperature values. So fill. The fill value is the same as the layer name. So X6 in this case. All right. And then the next thing is we want this to be in a default coordinate reference system. So we don't want this kind of to end up uh, in a bit weird way. So for that, we just specify port SF. And then we also would probably like to customize colors a bit. If you go for default R colors or ggplot colors in this case, you're going to get the blue palettes, which is a bit boring and it, you won't see much stuff. So what I sometimes like to do when I explore these things, I like to use scale fill viridis, which offers you a possibility to get viridis color palette in R. So we'll use scale fill viridis C, where C stands for continuous. Continuous is this uh, fill value. In our case, it's not discretized. And then if you want to choose specific palettes, you use this option argument. And for option, there are several things. I like to use something which is called plasma. And it's mostly based on uh, blue, purple, and yellow values. Well, you will see in a bit how it looks like. It looks uh, something as if something you can use for heat maps. And then finally, let's just remove everything from the background using uh, theme void arguments. All right. So we just run this now. And we go to the map that I'm going to show you that we just created. So this is the map that we uh, just created. Uh, so this is the plasma um, color palettes. And on the right hand side, you will also see the legend. It's not so much, I would say, um, you know, uh, useful because it's in Kelvins and we're used to Celsius degrees. We will actually improve this, uh, in some of the next plots, but for now, I just wanted to show you how it looks like. Also the, the order of the colors is not so, I would say, um, intuitive simply because, um, you know, the lower temperatures are darker and the higher temperatures are lighter. We don't want actually that we want uh, the the other way around. So we can fix all these things. I just wanted to, to show you like what we actually got here. Of course, uh, it's a bit looks a bit pixelized because it is also dictated by the resolution that is native to this one, which is um, uh, 0.1 times 0.1 degrees. Nevertheless, we can move on to the next stage and uh, where I want to actually show you how we can uh, do some data wrangling and deal with these awkward names and actually convert them into proper dates. And once we do that, we will be able to do uh, some plotting. Okay, so we learned how we can filter this NC file and select specific months and then we turn them into a data frame and then we can uh, create a plot with ggplot2. But we also want to plot all those 13 months for Poland and see how the temperature changed uh, over month, month by month. And to do that, uh, we again need to turn the whole uh, object into a data frame. But it is going to have a different structure and I'm going to show you in a bit how this looks like. So let's create a new object, which is going to be called Poland temp DF. And again, we will use as data frame from base R to convert the NC file now into a data frame. So Poland underscore temp. Again, we need to use X, Y equals true. And we also need to define that we will remove those NA values. All right. And let's then, after we create this, let's inspect this Poland uh, temp DF. And I'm going to show you now how it's different from the previous data frame. Uh, where we just selected one month. All right, so we run this. And let me just actually increase this a bit. So what you can see now here is we have X, Y, and instead of having just this third one for uh, the Celsius, uh, so, sorry, Kelvin degrees, 
we now have for each month a separate column. So in other words, this is in a wide format. What we want to have is we want to have the following. We want to have four columns here. X, Y, of course, one for the date, and then one for the temperature value. So we need to convert from this wide format into a long format. And this is what we are going to do next. All right, there is a very convenient function uh, from dplyr, from tidyverse, which is called pivot longer, which is going to help us uh, turn this white table into a long table. So let's create then another object, which is going to be called Poland temp long. And here we will uh, then pivot this Poland temp df. So let's create a pipeline. And then there is a function. So it's not from dplyr, actually it's from tidyr. This is why we in the beginning uh, loaded tidyr, because tidyr has this pivot longer function. And within this function, what we need to specify, we need to specify what are the fields that are gonna remain there. So they're not gonna be uh, transformed. And in our case, those are X and Y. So we need to specify like this, C, uh, so this is for array, and then we put this exclamation mark at the beginning, meaning uh, we are not going to include these, right? So this means exclude from this transformation. Uh, the next argument we need to specify with pivot longer is what are uh, what is going to be the name of that new column, right? So those for dates. Now you know that we will get x1 to x13 as values. So I would rather call them layers. So we will say names to and layer. All right. And then finally, how are we going to call those uh, temperature values that we're going to get? Uh, so I would just call them values. So you do that using the values to argument, values to, and then just value. All right. So, and finally, let's inspect, inspect a new object. Long time long, and let's actually run everything now, right? Okay, let me show you the new structure. So here it is. Here's what I was talking about. Now we have X and Y, so the coordinates, and we have value for that coordinates. But now we also have layers here. So for every layer, we have uh, the coordinates and the value. All right, next step is we want this layer, we want this to convert into dates. We want this to be meaningful so that we understand what this actually means. And I'm going to show you now how easy it is to do that. Creating dates from those layer names is easier than uh, it looks. So if you remember when we plotted June temperatures for Poland, we chose X6. That's because the June layer is the 6th starting from our first layer, which is 1st of January 2022. And the last one is X13, which is uh, January the 1st, 2023. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of uh, those X letters and just have numbers. Then what we need to do next is we need to create a separate vector uh, with also those numbers and another vector with dates that correspond to each of these numbers. And then those two vectors we can combine into a single data frame and use that integer as a key for joining it with our Poland temp long object. Okay, let's do that. First of all, what we want to do is with our, within our Poland temp long object, we want to create a new column, which is going to be called ORT. Now, this one is, as we said, we want to just uh, wipe off that X part. And we will use the sub function from base R, which helps us do that. This one says basically for the first letter in our string, get rid of it, right? And apply then this to Poland temp long and the layer field. All right. So let me actually show you what uh, this does. Let me just run this quickly. 
and let me just then show you so here is what it does it creates a table it has x y uh, it has also that layer name it has the value and now you can see that it has also these um, integers here now one more thing we need to do is we need to convert this one. We say it's integer because it looks like integer, but because it was carved out of a string, it still is a string. So we need to use as numeric from base R. Uh, and because it was a character, also had as character. So we're going to convert into integer this character right here. All right. So we just run this. Okay, so that's about it. We have for now this uh, new uh, column in our table. It's an integer. Now we need to create a separate data frame where every corresponding number from this ORs will have a date. So first of all, how do we create a data vector, which is, we're going to call data? Well, there is something which is called in base R sequence. So you can create a sequence of things, integers, numbers, or dates. So we need date. And you remember that at the very beginning, we had something which is called, which we define as start date. So we can use start date as our starting point to create those dates. And then we want, we say that starting from the start date, we want to create by month more dates. But how many dates? How many dates do we need? Well, we need 13, right? But you might need actually more. So I want to make something that would automate this. So we can use this ORT from Polytemp Long and just say the maximum of ORT from Polytemp Long is going to be our maximum length. Pretty convenient, isn't it? So let's just do that. So max from Poland temp long ports all right so let's uh actually let's run this and let's inspect uh this this data let's see what we actually got we need we want a range of uh, dates and as you can see we have 13 dates they start from 1st of january 2022 then they go to 1st of february march and they end with 1st of January, 2023. So this is exactly what we uh, need. Now, the second thing we need, we need to create another uh, vector, which is gonna be ORDs. Okay, so for ORDs, uh, we need values from one to 13 in our case. So one, two, and instead of me putting 13 here, which just corresponds with my use case, maybe in your use case, you will have more or, or less, I'm just going to write here something that will allow you also to get your own number. So the same we did here. So we're going to take maximum Poland temp long ports. All right. And now that we run this and we again inspect what the port is, you will see here it goes from 1 to 13. Now you might be wondering. Okay, we have now this datum and we have ORDs. So what do we do with this? Well, what we do next is we create a new data frame, which is going to be called, let's say, dates DF. And we use data frame from base R to declare it. So we use ORD and datum as the columns in this new data frame. Let me show you actually what I mean. So let's run this and then let's inspect this new data frame. So this is what this new data frame has. So as you can see, ORDs goes from 1 to 13 and has datum or a date where every number ORD is associated with the appropriate date. So if you remember from that pull and long term uh, table, uh, it also has ORD, it also has numbers, but it lacks the proper date. Now we can join this dates DF with pull and temp long table. And this is exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to create a new one called Poland Temp Dates because we're now going to add dates to it. And we will 
work with Euro, uh, sorry, not Europe, it's Poland, Poland, temp long. We're going to put this into a pipe and within this pipe uh, from the plier, we will left join. For those of you who are not familiar with join, so this comes from uh, SQL, left join, it means we will, uh, to this Poland temp long, we will join this dates df. And we'll keep everything that where they intersect and everything also from a Poland temp long itself. So here, this is what we're gonna join uh, to it. So dates df, and we're gonna join on port. All right. So that's that's one thing here. Now there's some other things. So if you remember before. Uh, we do have here Calvin's and we're not happy with that. We want to have Celsius. If you remember at the very beginning, maybe you not, but there is an easy way to convert from Calvin's to Celsius. And this is if you subtract 273.15 from Calvin's, you will get Celsius. So why don't we just do that immediately? Let's create a new column, which we're going to call, let's say, Celsius. So for that, we use the plier mutate function. And then we say, uh, I want a new column. It's going to be called Celsius, and it's all going to be based on that value, which is Kelvin's minus 273.15. All right, what else do we want to include in this pipeline? Well, the last thing is we perhaps want to get rid of some things that we don't need anymore. We don't need a layer name anymore. We now have dates. Also, ORD we don't need anymore. It served its purpose for just joining this and getting dates. And also, we don't need Calvins anymore. So let's finish this pipeline by uh, selecting uh, variables or columns that we need. So we need, we don't need layer. This is how you actually select something you want to drop in the plier select. You put minus and then the name of it. Very convenient. So minus ORT and as we said, minus value. Okay, now that we have this, uh, let's actually run this and after running i want to inspect this new poland temp dates so i'm just going to run again and i'm going to now show you what we finally have Ta -da! so we got x and y as before but now we have this datum so we have date here so for every coordinate, we have dates from 1 to 13 months here. And now finally, we have Celsius. So this is how you actually prepare your data in a long format. This is how you convert those awkward layer names into proper dates. This is how you get Celsius. Finally, select what you need. And we can now move on to create a legend breaks, also colors, and then finally uh, creating map and ggplot2. Our next task is to define uh, limits and the breaks. When I say limits, I mean the minimum and maximum values in our data and for breaks, uh, simply bings for our legend. So for the minimum and maximum values, we will create two objects, vmin and vmax, and we will apply the minimum and the maximum functions from base R. We will apply them to our newly created table, Poland Templates, and specifically to its column Celsius. Now that we have this, uh, we can actually run both of these lines and uh, see what are the minimum and maximum values for Poland in this 13 month period. All right. So for Poland this period, the minimum value is minus six degrees Celsius and the maximum temperature was in this period 22.1 degrees Celsius. Quite, quite interesting. Now we can define breaks. For the breaks themselves, um, what I like to use is the class in package that we loaded at the very beginning because it offers several techniques for creating bins. So let's call class int and its function class intervals. Now we will apply this function to Poland temp dates and Celsius column. In terms of the number of, of bins that we want to create, uh, we have several options. Uh, here we have a diversion scale, so sub zero and above zero values. 
so our palettes in the end is gonna have you know two contrasting uh, colors but uh, in this case i think we can go for a higher number of of pins and pins here you define by n now here is another tricky thing even though i say for example here i want n equals 10 it doesn't necessarily mean that by applying this function it's going to return me 10. it is going to highly depend on the distribution of your data right so let's see first of all how many values we we get here all right so n equals 10 and then what you need to put also is the style of of creating these bins so i would like nicely formatted uh, bins with nicely rounded values so i'm gonna go for a pretty break usually um, when I uh, use uh, this function to create breaks, I go for either Jenks or Fisher optimization. But they don't, uh, they don't provide nicely formatted round numbers uh, like this one, pretty one. All right, so let's actually, you know, let's check this one. Let's check what we are gonna get. But before we do that, to complete this function, uh, we need to also define here that we are looking for the breaks component of class intervals. So let's actually run this. Let's see uh, what are the breaks that we uh, just defined. Breaks. And here it is, actually. So we got how many? One, two, three, four. We got actually eight. Now, here's the thing of caution here. We said that our minimum value is minus six, right? So it means that this one is going to be omitted, minus 10. And we also said that the maximum one is 22. So this bin 25 is also going to be omitted. We're going to end up with only six values. I think that's a very low number because it's not going to show that much of variety uh, in our temperature in the current data. So what I do suggest, perhaps increasing this number a bit. I don't know, maybe like 14. I mean, let's see what we get now if we go for 40. Let's inspect breaks once more. And now we got actually a pretty higher number. So we got from minus eight to 24. Uh, we have here four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17. But keep in mind one more thing that some of these are gonna again um, be dropped. So minus eight for sure is going to be dropped and also 24, it's going to be dropped. So we're going to end up with like 15 values. I think this is fine. We can work with this. Let's customize our color palette for the temperature map. The default one in ggplot2 is simply a blue palette. I'm not really happy about it because I do want to show divergent colors here. For example, for the sub-zero values, we could use uh, shades of blue. And for the warmer colors or warmer temperatures, uh, above zero, we can use, for example, uh, uh, color shades of pink or red. We will uh, do that using one of the packages that we loaded at the beginning. It's called R Color Brewer, and it has a specific function where you can define the number of colors you want, as well as the palettes. We'll be using the spectral palette. If you're not familiar with it, you can check it out, as well as this. Uh, package. It's one of the, I would say, uh, most used ones when uh, creating these temperature maps in, in R that I've seen so far, and it's also colorblind friendly, so we can definitely go for it. So let's create a calls object, and let's call this R color brewer, which has also a, a function called brewer pal. So over here, we define the number of uh, colors we want so let's say 17 minus 2 so we should have like something around 15 and then let's create the spectral based on the spectral palette all right uh i think we can just uh kind of uh, like run this and see what we what we get all right so the colors oh so there is a warning now. i want to show you this one i usually ignore warnings but this one is i think very informative it says that n is too large so the number of wins uh bins we created is too large and maximum is 11 for the spectral palette all right um this gets me thinking now what do we do in ggplot because if we can pass only 11 but we need 15 then perhaps you know ggplot2 then is going to you know throw an error it's going to fail well, don't worry about this because it is possible to create more, 
But what we need to do is we need to wrap this one into yet another function, which is color ramp palette, which is going to allow us to create even more. All right. Color ramp palette. So the next thing I want to check here is, all right, just based on these colors that we provided, what are actually the values that, that we get? Okay, it says again it's too much, so let's put 11. Okay, let's put 11 here, then let's run, and let's inspect these colors. You can also ignore, you can leave 15, it's not going to throw an error, but just uh, sometimes it's a bit annoying seeing all these warnings. Okay, so here are the values. Okay, these are hex code, doesn't tell me much. I don't know whether this is in a good, good order or not. But what I can do in VS Code, I can actually inspect this. So if I actually copy this first value and I just put it into some random array, uh, VS Code shows me that the first value here is pink. All right, so that means we start with warmer colors and we go uh, into, into colder. Well, this is actually not in line with our actual legend uh, breaks because our legend break starts with sub-zero values and then transitions into warmer. So in other words, what we need to do here is we will need to reverse the order of this palette. So we will use a rev function from base R and one thing of caution, you wanna plug it in uh, after color ramp palette, but before our color brewer, brewer palette. So like this. And then you just also add one bracket at the end. All right. Um, so now we can actually run this. And yeah, we got a different order. All right. The next thing is uh, now we have the colors. We're happy about it. We can jump into ggplot2 and start creating our first uh, temperature map of Poland. And we can finally jump into making our first map. In this tutorial, I want to show you how we can make two types of maps. The first one is going to be a static map. And this is what I'm going to show you the first. Uh, it's going to be based on panels. So for each year, we're going to create a small map of Poland showing what was the temperature for uh, Poland in that month. And uh, over there, we will be using a uh, face of the wrap function in ggplot2, a very convenient one. Um, so the first thing I want to do here is define a coordinates reference system. You remember that we started off with just the default, which is WGS84, but here I want to use a more um, native European um, coordinates reference system, which is called Lambert projection. So here it is, it's a bit long. Um, so I want to use that one also for Poland since it's a European country. So let's start writing our ggplot2 code. We will create Poland's map. That's the first thing. And we're going to call ggplot. And for our data, we're going to use Poland temp dates. That's the first thing we want to do, right? The next thing is to map uh, raster files, we will use geom tile. Geom tile. So for geom tile, since we are building our first layer here, we want to define aesthetics just as we did before. And here we will have, as before, uh, x, y, and we're going to fill with Celsius this time. All right. So what this will produce is this is simply going to, you know, create uh, raster files, but it's not gonna uh, actually put them into separate panels for every month. For that, as I said, we need a facet wrap. Function. So facet, uh, facet wrap, facet wrap, and here we want to define what is the fields uh, that we want to use to create different panels, and we want datum, right? This one is for the date, or actually months in our case. All right, now that we created this, we can go into customization of our, uh, you know, legend. How is this going to look like? And since we are dealing with um, continuous scale, we need to use scale fill. We use fill because remember here, we use the fill function here in our base layer. Scale fill, gradient. If you're not familiar with this function, check it out. This one is used to create or customize, better say, legend 
for a continuous scale. All right, so within this one, first thing I want to define is the legend title. Why? Because I don't want people wondering, are we working with Celsius Kelvin? So we're working with Celsius degrees. So for the name, I'm going to put Celsius degree. Now comes the heck part about colors. So for colors, we said, oh, I need actually 15 values, but our color brewer can make only 11. Now, because we've wrapped it into that color ramp palette, we can now create more. And the way you do that is very simple. So we just do calls and then you open this brackets and then you say the value wants a new value. We want 15. Excellent. Then uh, we can define also limits uh, limits in our case are uh, we define them v min and v max and we can also define uh, uh, labels here or breaks but breaks would be fantastic since we already created them breaks equals breaks alternatively you can also uh, place labels there um, imagine you want to, um, you know, customize them a bit so you can also do that. But in our case, we don't have the need for that, really. We can just continue with building this, this query, right? It's so convenient with ggplot to you just, you know, make one thing and then add plus and make another thing, add to everything. And the next thing we will do is, as we said uh, at the beginning of this section, we want a Lambert projection. So we need to define it here, which is done through chord SF, where you say CRS equals, and then the object we created, CRS, L-A-E-A, -E and then plus. The next thing is customizing a bit our legend, which is done through guides, all right? Guide argument. So, we are going to create a legend for the fill argument. So we need to say fill equals guide legends and then open bracket. So we are now customizing legend for that fill argument specifically. Here uh, we can decide how is it going to look like? Is it going to be vertical or is it going to be horizontal? Uh, let's say we want the direction of our legend to be horizontal. I would like to put it uh, to make it horizontal. I want to put it at the top of our, uh, you know, of our graph or our map. So direction will be horizontal. All right, so the next thing is how big are those, uh, you know, legend keys are going to be? Well, I want to make them thin, but I want to make them also long since they are horizontally oriented. So key um, height, it's going to be in units and units are going to be millimeters. I'm just used to them and uh, unit will be let's say 1.5 it looks pretty small but trust me it's not going to be that small i mean if needed we can also increase the the legend um, uh, text so that's the first uh, thing and second is key width so for key width i would like to have something that is a bit longer let's say like one centimeter or like 10 millimeters that's fine. We can also specify what we want to do with the title. So uh, so that's going to be title dot position. And then let's say we want the title to be at the top. Um, we can also specify label position. So this is for the legend text itself. Uh, we can put it so below the legend. So like bottom. We can also specify how are they going to be justified, horizontally speaking? So that is done through title dot h just. And if we want to center it, we're going to use 0.5, which we definitely want. And we want the same for label dot h just. We also want it to be centered. Now, because it's a horizontal legend, the number of rows, it's going to be one. All right. Um, and we want everything to be ordered by row. So that equals true. And uh, I think this is about it. Yeah, we have label position. We have title position. Everything is there. 
All right, so we're done with the guide part. And now we add more. And the next thing we want to add is theme. So first of all, we're going to go for theme minimal and then further customize this, the main theme. All right, so within the main theme, some of the things that I want to get rid of is those access lines. So if you want to get rid of elements in ggplot theme, you need to specify element blank arguments. Um, I also want to get rid of those axis titles for longitude and latitude, as well as the labels for uh, the degrees on the side. So axis dot title dot x equals, and then just I'm going to copy this one here, and the same goes for the title on the y side. And I also, for x and y, I want to really get rid of, as I said, those um, the, the text, actually labels, right? Labels. That's two. Then uh, axis ticks as well, together with, with lines. Axis ticks it also equals element. These are some things that are necessary to do. They are quite tedious, they're boring, but you need to define them if you really want to work with a clean background. All right, we're done with this uh, part about you know the, the background itself, but now we, we can also customize further some things like, for example, legend. So as I said, I would like legend to be positioned at the top which we can declare with legend position argument. And we can also specify further in terms of legend title and legend text what we want. So let's start with legend title. Because we're here dealing with text, we need to specify element text. And then inside of the brackets for element text, we can say what actually we want to do. Uh, let's say in terms of the size, um, yeah, we want something actually maybe a bit bigger so that we can see what's going on. So maybe for um, this one, we can go for uh, size 10 for the title. And then for the color, I'm going to keep it at charcoal gray, so gray 10. Okay. And then for the legend text, I would do just copy and paste here. But instead of going for size 10, perhaps, uh, sorry, 11, maybe for size 10. All right, we also got this one. Now we can further also specify, let's say we want to have also title. So that would be plot.title. And again, it's element text. And then within that one, what we can specify is again um, size. Let's, for example, say that for the title, we're going to go for something a bit bigger. Let's say like 20 and let's say the color is going to be also charcoal gray and what else can we specify here we can also do the how it's going to be horizontally positioned let's say we want it to be centered so h just is going to be 0.5 in that case um and then perhaps a bit uh we're going to place it a bit lower towards the map so it's we just make sure it doesn't get out of the, the scope. So V just or the, the vertical one, it's going to be minus three, which means we're going to pull it closer towards the, the, the map. All right. Um, and then we can also specify and get rid of those uh, grids uh, on our uh, map. So panel uh, grids as well. Panel grids dot major equals elements blank and uh, the same goes for panel grid minor so those are the grids that are exist in, in the background if you don't get rid of them they usually just make a mess so i'm just going to also do it for minor all right um we could also let's say do some subtitles if we want so it's the same like here just plot instead of plot title we just do plot subtitle 
So that's that's also quite possible. But what I like to do is also define the margins here. So I would go for like plot margin and just decrease that empty space that exists around around every map. So uh, the way we do that is by uh, using the, the units. So unit, and then we provide like a list of the things we want to change in this one. Well, the unit is going to be, uh, yeah, let's say lines, for example. And then for this one, top equals, we're going to give some space at the top so we can see the title and everything. But everything else, we're just going to set to zero. So right equals zero, left equals zero, and bottom equals zero. Right, so let's just put this a bit down so that you can see the full code. All right, so we're also done with this one. Uh, what else could we do? Uh, if we want a caption, we can also do the captions. But I think for now, this is fine. Um, so we have, you see, theme occupies most of space. One thing we can define after the theme is actually labs. Uh, so once again, labs, this is the place where you can define things you want to see. So we don't want... Uh, X here, so just we're going to leave it empty, and also we don't want any Y title on the Y axis as well. Um, for the title itself, what we can do is we can say uh, monthly temperature. Mm, yeah. Other things we don't really necessarily wanna wanna define. So that's about it. So we define now how we want this map to look like. We also define this coordinate refer system. So now we can just run everything, make sure that actually this runs. There are no any problems. And after that, we can just inspect the map. All right. So we ran this, and now let's just let's just actually type. Maybe it's a better practice. Let's type print. Poland map, right? We'll run this now and let's see what we actually got. All right, and here is our map with uh, panels where every panel is the temperature for that specific month. As you can see, it's organized uh, from left to right. And uh, starting from the first row, it goes from January the 1st, 2022, and then transitions to the next month and it ends with January the 1st, 2023. Uh, we also notice that the legend is in the top. One thing that I would change here is the legend title. I would put actually the legend itself a bit lower because currently as is, uh, this overlaps with, with the title here. Um, yeah, we also see uh, some patterns here. Um, and what we see actually is that the warmest months as expected are those in the summer. So. Uh, in this case, June, July, and, and August, and others a bit uh, cooler, with the coolest one being in, of course, January and December. All right, so this is the first type of the map, is a static map that I want to show you. And the next map I want to show you is how you can animate uh, this map, so that you basically have just a single map, but then transitions to, to different maps. It's time to create the animated map of Poland, and for this step, we can simply start off our work from that Poland map that we created with some slight modifications. And first one is that we don't really need panels here since we will be creating separate frames. The second is the legend position in the top didn't really work for us. It was overlapping with the title. So I suggest we move it under the map. Um, so we will be using in this one a uh, dynamic subtitle where we will show the date for each frame. So I would like here to customize a bit this option in the theme. Uh, the way we do that is through the plot dot subtitle. And then over here, we have to define several things. First of all is the size. All right. I want something bigger than the title. Let's say twice as big as the title. So like 40. In terms of the color, it would be nice to have something that stands out. So I would opt for something which is more kind of a stronger. Let's say we go for something which is more orange, C43, C4E. This should give us something which is more kind of a orange, orange, red. 
Um, I also want this sat tile to be centered and I would like it to be a bit lower also, but not as low as the title. So like minus one, let's say. All right. And then finally, we need to create here to define a dynamic sat tile. What is it going to be like? Um, so the way you do that, if you are using dates for this dynamic sat tile is you first of all need to declare as date within curly brackets, and then you need to put something generic, which is called frame time. Um, and this would be basically it. The next step is to add some more animation options. So we'll create a new separate object, time-lapse pollen map, and we will here be working from the pollen map. So we'll be adding things to it. The first one we want to add is uh, what is the actual column that we will use for transition? In our case, it's called datum. So transition time and then time equals, again, we need to declare it as date and datum. The second is adding some more flavor to these transitions. I want them to be a bit smoother with the fade in and fade out effect. So for the fade in, uh, we use enter uh, fade arguments and for the fade out exit fade arguments all right and then finally what we want to have is a certain smoothing function that we will use for these uh, transitions uh, which comes through the ease aesthetics argument and there are several options here you should definitely check the gg animate um, library online and see what are the options for this easy aesthetics argument so we will go for the linear one, which is um, offers still very smooth transitions, but it's also a default one. And we will also define interval at which the transitions occur as points to. Uh, this is neither very fast nor too slow transition. So uh, I like to opt for it somewhere between, let's say, uh, one, point 0.1, point 0.2. All right, now that we have this time-lapse spawn map, we can finally apply GG Animate. So we create a new object, animated temp map, and we then apply GG Animate, uh, especially the animate uh, function from GG Animate. And here we pass time lapse Poland a map. Here we can specify several things, like one of them is number of frames. I try to stick to several, uh, you know, few frames per. The number of dates I have, so 13 months, so uh, times four or five, that would be like something around 65. Uh, duration uh, could be something like 20 seconds or so. Now, a good thing about GG Animate is that you can also pause the video at the beginning, at the end. This is done through start end. Sorry, start pause, start pause, and end pause. So we want at the beginning to be a bit, there is some kind of a break and a longer one, which is going to basically freeze the last frame. Um, and then we can also specify heights, which is going to be seven inches, which is the pulse and width as well. It's also going to be seven. We can also specify things like resolution, like 300 pixels. Uh, we can also go even for a higher. It's not a big deal. We can also define frames per second, like to keep it 15. And finally, a renderer, uh, the one which is going to render these images. So, uh, uh, gives, key, gives key renderer, where we will set loop to true. So, we want to create an endless video here, right? All right. So, once we have this, we just simply need to run everything. Uh, and before we actually do that, let me just add one more stuff at the end, which is saving this file. So using the anim save function, let's call it Poland temperature gif and animated temp map is this last object that we want. Okay, now let's run this one by one. Let's first run actually everything until here. And then I'm gonna show you actually what this produces. So we are now running that part, which is a rendering all those images. So creating them, rendering, 
using GG Animate option. And here it is. This is the progress bar of how rendering is going. So it's um, here it shows you at what frame per second is working. And this is the estimated time of completion. So when this comes to the end, the next thing is we will then run that um, animation save. And uh, this will then actually uh, put together all those plots or images that this one has created and uh, produce a nice GIF for us. All right, so the final step we are going to take in this tutorial is to export this object into a GIF file. And we're going to use ggAnimateAnimSave option where we need to specify the name of this new uh, object or file. So Poland underscore temperature dot GIF. And then finally, also the object that we are going to use. So animated temp map. All right. And now let's just run this and uh, finally inspect that animated map. All right. And here it is, the animated temperature map of Poland starting from January the 1st, 2022, going all the way through the summer and we see it getting hot and then ending with January the 1st, 2023. So we uh, achieved here, what we achieved is we created temperature map, we applied um, the color we need. Uh, we of course use the dates to create a monthly average temperature in Poland. One thing I'm not completely satisfied with this map is the resolution of this raster. So it's quite pixelized. And one of the things with Krigar currently, it is possible to resample this to get a high resolution. But it seems that the function for doing that, which is called Krigar, uh, is not really working. So I open up an issue on, on GitHub with, uh, uh, with the creator of the package. So let's see how this goes. But for now, this is what it is. This is what we can use. Anyways, I hope this was helpful for you. Uh, I hope this will encourage you to uh, recreate this map or create new ones. Um, and uh, this is how you can actually uh, work with NC files in R and how you can plot them and create uh, different types of, of maps. All right, that's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial as much as I did walking you through the capabilities of the Krigar package. In today's tutorial, we covered quite a lot of topics, but the most important ones were definitely how you communicate with the API of the climate data store and how you can download basically any weather uh, data for any period for any part of the world. Uh, in today's tutorial specifically we created a temperature map of Poland but I'm really really excited about finding uh, out about your own projects and where this tutorial will take you on your uh, next journey. If, however, you would like to recreate a map from today's tutorial, feel free to check the link to my GitHub repo down below in the description. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback, feel free to reach out to me here on YouTube, but also on Instagram and Twitter. Also, if you are new to R, or if you are an advanced user as well, I have prepared a few uh, mapping and data visualization tutorials with R, so check them out. And see you next time.